we start, uh, I would... Hello everyone, welcome. Before we start, and I hand over the micro microphone to Marina Fokides, I would kindly ask you to wear a mask. As long as you don't drink, we would be pleased if you wear a mask, um, as it's quite full. Thank you very much. So everybody with your masks ready? <laughs> Here. Yeah, there is more space. Please take your seats. So, um, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for coming. It's wonderful to see so many bodies. Uh, in that room, and I thought, I, and I think it's the right event for this because this time it will be a talk, but also a kind of a body interaction as well. And um, so, welcome to the six, to the seventh already event, the seventh crossing of the public program, the Fortress of um, Crossed Bodies and Destinies cross destinies, and um, we'd like to welcome very Angelo Plessas, we'd like to thank very much uh, the Summer Academy and Sophie Colts for um, hosting this event and for organizing um, this situation in the best of the capacity and uh, for so much people and Sin Simone Rudolf and, and Ke Gaia and Karina and all the team. Also welcome everybody that is um, now following us on the, on the internet in the live stream and thank you for being with us uh, from all over the world. So, Angelo Plesas is going to um, guide us through a lecture performance to his work and then to a guided meditation. And then after that, you would be um, able to ask some questions if you have questions. Before that, I would like to introduce him. Uh, Angelo Plesas, despite a very good friend for the last 20 years, maybe, more. or more, more, please, <laughs> uh, cover the years. Uh, uh, lives and works between Athens and Kimi, a peninsula in Greece. His work highlights this ambiguous relationship between spirituality and technology. He's, trying, he's putting together um, social relationships and identity politics, if you like, together with uh, interconnectivity and the wider space of the internet. Um, his activities range from rituals to um, artist residencies, from self-publishing to interactive websites. One of these websites is what you see now uh, in your screen. And this was also Angelo's kind of first uh, works within the art world, this kind of abstract, let's say, affirmative paintings, if you like, that you can interact from your screen from wherever you are. Uh, he also does self-publishing books and also educational projects. Um, on the past years, he has organized some events that they were called Internal Internet Brotherhood and Sisterhood and the Experimental Educational Protocol in different remote places of the world. And actually, as we speak, uh, an, um, an educational protocol is taking place in the Salzburg oh. Academy. So, so around us is people that they are taking students, let's call it this way, for the sake of the academy, that they are taking part in one of these uh, experimental uh, uh, protocols, educational protocols. Uh, Angelo has exhibited in many places, and I will say a few, if you allow me. 
recently, uh, 2017, he did the work for Documenta 14 in Athens and Kassel. Uh, then he did the work recently in 20, 2021 or 22 already in 13th Kwanzu Biennial. He also participated in um, the Gardena Biennial this year, and he has sold works in Contemporary Art Institute in Chicago, in, um, in, um, also in um, Onassis Foundation, and uh, in Jeux de Pomme and other places around the world. He's um, the initiator and the founder of a project space in Athens that is called Pet Projects. And uh, he also got, in 2015, the Deste Prize in Athens, which is a very important prize for um, a contemporary artists in Greece. Um, he will speak to us about his projects, and then he will guide us to this uh, meditation. Thank you so much for being here, and please find ways to interact with each other uh, under the guidance of Angelo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Do I use this microphone all the... Oh, no, okay. I leave it here. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you, Sophie, and thank you, Marina, for this very warm introduction. And uh, so we will... There is this presentation here I'm going to do so I can introduce my work to you. And then the other half, or maybe one-third of this time that we have here, we will do this guided meditation. So it will be really great if you can choose a very, very comfortable uh, chair or place where you can feel safe and comfortable. Uh, okay, so I start now with this piece, uh, which was made, as Marina said, was made recently for a show in South Korea. And, um, but I'm showing this because this is one of my, this is part of a body of work I started in the, in the mid-late 90s that treated websites as uh, experiments of color, code, movement, and um, different kind, as a new window to this new, a new artistic form that at that time it was very, very uh, limited. And... Um, I was also fascinated at some point when I started my, I, without even having intentionally been becoming an artist, I, wa I was very interested in the relationship between machines and uh, humans. So um, I started buying domain names uh, with the extension of .com and I was uh, making this interactive um, strange animations with coding. I was doing them all by myself. And uh, then whatever was kind of describing this piece, I was actually buying the domain name on .com extension. In a way, this piece was becoming a little bit uh, unique in a way. And now some people telling me, oh, that was a kind of a first way making NFTs of something that is digital. I was kind of with buying the domain name, which is only a unique address. I was kind of making it unique. Uh, so for this one, for example, which is a recent one, I used it also in this installation that I will show you shortly uh, as a techno shamanistic tool. Uh, in this installation I did in Korea. Uh, but I want to stay just a few moments on this uh, body work of mine. Uh, during the 90s, as I was telling you, I was very much intrigued with experimental software. Uh, I was also hanging out in different chat rooms. And um, so I was, uh, I was swapping like code with different people that they were not really artists. We were kind of, I don't know, some people would call us coders. I was kind of more artistic. I was not an artist at that time. I was studying industrial design. And uh, I was um, very excited being in this part of the, I couldn't like make paintings. I was really bored of painting. And that the internet for me was a new window. 
So the browser window especially, I thought it would be great as I use it for my canvas. So this is my first ever website. I did it in 2000. And basically I took a selfie of myself that, and uh, I put it on Photoshop. I made this uh, weird filter. It's a bit like a painting thing. And then I place it in this circular Internet Explorer. At that time, many of you was not even born at that time. We were using Netscape, Internet Explorer, these browsers that were working with very, very slow connections. And these websites actually defined also my aesthetic because we were having slow connections, so everything had to be very, very, very straightforward, very, uh, not very light in kilobytes, so the aesthetic was very, very simple graphics. Black and white, not so many colors. So this is my first ever website. Uh, one other, like around that time, is this one, which is this um, childlike uh, um, animation, like this futile video game that you, there is no actually like winning or losing in that. And this creature is like, it's a logo of my initial AP, Angelo Plessas. And then I was making that for, and these pieces were actually shown in galleries. This piece was shown in New York at Deitch Projects with a show defining this new movement about internet art before even social media, before even smartphones. So it's very hard to imagine life without smartphones, but that was it. That was the early stages. And uh, okay, so now, basically in my work, there are two paths that I follow. One is the clash between the immaterial and the physical, and the other is the paradoxical relationship in a way between technology and spirituality. At some point in my work I was kind of burned out working a lot with the screens. So I felt my brain was kind of going crazy. So I started uh, working a lot with spiritual stuff. And in Greece we have a tradition, you cannot really escape from the ancient tradition, and there were all these meditative and pagan things that was actually, they were part of my aesthetic in my websites. I don't have so much time to show you my websites because I wanna go to other parts, but um, you can, I can send you or find on my website some URLs. And um, so I'm going a little bit to the re recent projects, in, um, in Korea, I was invited two years ago for the 13th Gwangju Biennial. So um, I was invited uh, to... So when the curators asked me, Natasha and Defne, what would be my project, I thought I was already very inspired by Asia. And um, I asked them to work with a shaman, a real shaman. And um, this shaman, uh, Korea is a very, very important case study for my work because Korea at the same time has a lot of indigenous um, folk traditions, but also embedded in a way and presented through technology. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a country that technology and the internet is very much penetrated. You can even see very old people working like with their smartphones and doing things through the internet. So that was a very, very interesting um, uh, research for me. So I asked the biennial to find me a shaman, a real shaman that, so I started having these uh, sessions with her through a translator. She did not even speak English. And we were, um, we were doing this workshops, she was using me in a way to do her thing as well uh, to a Westerner who she would not understand. Some Western people like us don't really understand shamanism in this way, the way people from Asia get it. And I think it's loading now, it will come up soon. And um, what we were doing basically, 
I wanted also for my work not to actually culturally appropriate her practice and show it in the biennial. What was interesting for me, we would collaborate and she will take like uh, themes of my work and she will do her rituals inside my installation. Actually, they're not loading, but I will show you. Okay, we can see this video and I can also let you, uh, I can, yeah. So basically, when I arrived in Korea, after a two-week quarantine, I went out from the hotel and the, the shaman invited me in these very, very sacred places in Korea where many, many miracles, according to, the, to her, are happening. So first I went to this lake, minus 10 degrees, February 2021 in Korea, and there is this tower that basically she is doing some sort of a body purification. So she invited me to go there. We met there for the first time. And actually, to, as a gift, I made this costume for her that she's wearing right now. She immediately wore it. And um, this, uh, the fabrics that I use also in my work, because I do a lot of fabric works that I will show you, they are, uh, in a way, kind of called organite fabrics. Organite is this like positive energy fabrics that they look like polyester. They have these special, special properties warding off technology. Like, for example, you wear this and you get any electromagnetic radiation. So, in a way, I went there and at some point she told me, you have to make a wish. I also prepared this uh, quilt that I'm wearing there, which is this mask, I call them mask, and it's a prop for these rituals I'm also doing in my work. Masks in shamanism is a very, very important element, is a very important tool. And I made this kind of huge emoji in a way with three eyes, and I wore this uh, while we were doing. So basically she told me I had to go around her and I should make this kind of like, uh, rotating myself, at some point with this cold, I would become so ecstatic and I would start like thinking images of myself into these very beautiful settings and wishes of myself. So I had uh, uh, Michelangelo who was there, uh, he was taking all these videos while we were doing, I was not supposed to use these videos because they, they happened quite accidentally. But then they became so beautiful and so meaningful for me that I showed them in the installation. Uh, let me show... Ah, exactly after the lake, she told me, oh, you are so strong. You managed to do this. Then I will tell you to the, take you to the second stage. So we climbed up this very, very steep mountain and we went to this place where there is this rock that looks like a face. It's this wind god that she tells. And she made me drink of this beautiful drink. And then I became also ecstatic, ecstatic there. And uh, she, we, she, made, um, she made me do this kind of thing going around wearing my quilt that she kind of purified also these fabrics in a way. And she told me, uh, she gave me some fortune telling about the specific piece in the biennial that opened like two weeks after that. And now I'm going to show you uh, installation shots from this piece. And um, so it was this a pavilion made of this like silver fabric that it's of course this organite fabric that I found it through a company that um, it was kind of warding off technology but at the same time I'm using a lot of of silver in my work since many years and I also sewed these huge um, quilts some of them are big, some of them are smaller, that they have all this symbolism of ancient Greece, but also Korea for this specific. These are all masks. And I also use a lot of uh, 
techno-pagan uh, symbolism like Wi-Fi symbols, um, things that some uh, hackers were using also before, some, and these are all talismans. This is actually like a, a furba, which is this like dagger that you put it in the, in the um, and I made even a website out of that. So um, inside, I had these three big websites that acted as techno-shamanic uh, tools that basically you could go, if the shaman and me were not there, one could go into this installation and they could use a little bit this installation as a joystick for self-improvised, uh, self-educational things about shamanism and technology. They could even take these quilts and wear them. And um, in the back where I, you can see myself wearing it, I'm actually resigned the Techno Shamanist Art Manifesto. I even wrote a manifesto about Techno Shamanist Art that you can read it on the main website. It's very big manifesto. And then people could go inside the, the place and they could get all these blankets and they could sit down and meditate. There were also videos about meditation in there. Uh, let me show you. At some point, we did this um, ritual inside. The I brought the shaman from this sacred place that she lives in the middle of nowhere in Korea. And uh, I should find this video. Uh, Anyway, I can't find the video right now. It's this very, yeah. Uh, anyway, if I find it, see it now. It's this ritual we did inside this installation and she purified the whole biennial. She came from my, from my installation and then we went all over. And that happened also with the people of the, because COVID was happening, we couldn't be so many people. So we were doing it in groups. Um, I have to move to another project I did very recently. It's uh, the Gerdena Biennial, which is in the South Tyrol. And there I made uh, the meditation of all beings. Basically, I write a lot. And whatever I write, they become videos. And at that time, this meditation of all beings, it speaks about the interconnectedness with all this universal energy that contains all our bodies, plants, animals, uh, extraterrestrials, bacteria, everything. So I made this video that actually it's a visualization of my meditation process every day. I, I visualize about things and it's also a very interesting internet subculture. Let me show it to you. Uh, okay, it's this one. So I use this TikTok aesthetic. In TikTok, there is this subculture that I call it TikTok messianism. So there are these young people, my, my, my millennials, that they speak about this new kind of spirituality. It's a techno-spirituality. Sometimes it's serious, very good, important. Sometimes it's not something. It's just, you know, uh, people showing themselves there. And um, I found it very interesting using these tools that TikTok is, you have these ready-made tools and actually I kind of recreated them in this video, having myself a little bit as uh, like a um, video performer in a way. Well, this is not online, but it's happening on this video. So I speak, there are 12 different chapters that I speak about different kinds of instances in this world, from plants Free of to present day thoughts, thoughts, I am allowing my spirit to float in a new situation, dispelling my thoughts into waves. So I allow this, this video is all done by me, even the sounds, no I use states, positions, all my and photos from my archive. I inhale particles and 
Actually, I put my. I was I not supposed to put myself, but this actor I was supposed to take, she didn't want to take part. So I said, okay, I don't have time to do it. So I, I placed myself inside there. But it makes more sen sense actually because the text and my voice, it's becoming a bit of a video performance. When I was doing this chapter, now, it speaks about I viruses. I had COVID. And a little bit, you can hear my voice a bit more. Uh, pushing ecstatically viruses and parasites into the abyss of black holes. I inhale strength and exhale seeds. Lies. Toads. Anyway, so now I'm moving very fast. Do we have... What time is it now? Yeah. Okay. We have a bit of time. Uh, at the same time, my piece there took the form of these quilts. Next to the screening room, we had these quilts that I use, as I told you, uh, this... Um, EMF protection fabrics and at the same time at this castle there I did this gathering of about 150 people and I, I made the text that I'm using in the video I made a communal meditation and uh, I'm wearing also this um, uh, cape that um, it's done by these fabrics and it's done with all my symbols and stuff and let's move now. So for um, Documenta, I did in 2017, I was very, I was invited to Documenta to do two things. Both, uh, we had to use both places as artists, one in Castle and one in Athens, because Documenta 14 happened also in Athens at that time. Uh, I, for the Athens piece, I made this installation that uh, actually is, uh, it's uh, started from a gathering of students and artists that I, we, as the project I'm doing here in the castle, it's called Experimental Education Protocol, and it's speaking about experiential education. So this project happens like this. I choose a case study, which is always a place and a person, and I come up with a statement. And then I invite students and other artists to come up with educational uh, workshops and that actually they, we are all participating in that and these educational workshops end up in performances or they just stay as educational workshops. And we go to these faraway places. Uh, for this one, we went to Delphi. And um, so I collected the material of these artists there and the case study for this is very important was Delphi, which was the place where omens about the future were given. In the ancient Greece, you would go to Delphi and they would give you this omen about your life or about wars, about anything. At the same time, I met a woman that was a neighbor of mine. And after a long time that I knew her, I'm making very short a story, this woman confided in me in the World War II, she was a spy. The Greek secret services commissioned her to spy on the Germans. To, and because she was staying near a military base in Athens, basically they found her and she, they, they followed her and she was a very, very educated person. They could, you know, confide in her. So basically what happened, this woman was... Um, spying on the Germans while, during the occupation and she was actually giving all the secret service, the Greek secret service, what the Germans were planning to do. And she did it in a great way. And accidentally, nobody knew about the story. This woman, in a way, at some point 
in the 40s, she got these medals from the state, and then she emigrated to the United States for a reason. And she came back to Greece very... And she was my neighbor, and at some point when she confided this story, I said, listen, this story has to be become very, very... It should be known. Nobody knows. So I, she became my case study, the person that was actually... There was some sort of a modern Pythia, a woman that she would actually, with her technology, her eyes, would actually predict wars. So I took her, all her, saved the archive that she had, basically this part where I'm showing you, there were all these coded, coded um, symbols of her daily, she was given to the Greek uh, secret service, all these in codes, like the way hackers use now, coding like these dots, uh, secret, things that people could only read. If a German person could arrest her, they, could, they didn't have any witnessing that was, she was spying on them. So I made this installation in the Fine Arts School of Athens, and I took... She also became a model after World War II. She became a model for painters, which is strange. She also became a model in a German book about Greece, which is also very strange. And at some point, I took all her material, I placed it in one part of the installation, and in the other part, I made an interview of her that if we had time, I would love to show this, but we don't have time. And I interviewed her in her house, and she was explained to me her technological skills, which was basically her eyes and her charm, speaking with German, with the Germans, speaking also, trying to, you know, and she confided a lot of things in there. At the same time, I had these screens on the side where I collected material of what the students and the other artists saw from this gathering of seven days in Delphi. So I made also these self-publishing books that you can see on the side. And I made this aesthetic, which was like a school. You could go and sit there and you could learn things about how to use your skills of the eyes, things that you don't know, uh, about observance, surveillance in the times of the internet. There were many issues uh, that we were touching in this installation. Um, and the other thing I did, that was my Athens project. Uh, the other, the, my, my contribution for the castle one was another project also. I call it the Eternal Internet Brotherhood Sisterhood, which was a guerrilla gathering of artists, curators, designers that I was doing for six consecutive, consecutive years in different places in the world. It started in Anafi, in very far away places where the internet was, was, was not even existing. So my idea was to invite all these internet artists in a place where we would go with no internet. We would go and come in faraway places and actually the first one happened, also Marina was there and um, it happened in this island in Greece that was a pirate island in the medieval times. And, um, and the second one happened in Mexico in this surrealist park where actually Sophie, this is where we met accidentally. Yeah. And um, it's this place. Yes. And uh, so for Documenta, when uh, I proposed to do the Eternal Internet Brotherhood in part of Documenta, so I invited also other artists and we went to this uh, what was I was interested in castle that was not shown before in any documenta, it's the tradition of the communes. In castle there is this tradition, these people are gathering there, they buy a piece of land together and they make these communal houses. They cultivate their own uh, plants, their own food. Basically, we 
went before Documenta started. We went for 10 days in this commune called Donberg, outside of a castle, where there is a revival of Germanic shamanism. It was also interesting, this topic. It was perfect for my project. Space, especially these rocks there, they, they do this kind of witches, rituals every May. So I chose May to do it, doing the Walpurgis night, it's called, probably you know it. And uh, I invited all these artists there, and we stayed next door to these rocks. There is this beautiful commune that also the communes were part of the project. So I invited the communes also. Part of my budget of the piece is to take this budget and give it to one commune to build this, uh, this installation that I would show in Castle later, that also they would be credited in this, um, in this uh, project. So this is what happened actually. It was this amalgam of um, videos and uh, you could go inside this installation. And for example, this here, this looks like lamps. It's an analog, analog clock that I did it with children in one of the communes of Castle. So I commissioned the children. I gave them also some money to work on this invention that it's called um, analog clock. And it's actually, you can tell the, the, the time, the current time, through looking at the, the colors of these lamps. At the same time, I also donated artworks. I made a special symbol talisman to each commune in Castle. There were six, I think, I remember, six. And I basically put this projection of these logos that I donated to the communes on this Leonardo da Vinci tent that one of the communes constructed. And I donated back to them. So this is an open source. I work a lot with open source and public domain imagery. And I made this installation that people could go, sit on the couch, see what we did. They could also like take parts. Weekly, we had these therapy sessions and performances happening around this installation. And um, this is the logo of the Eternal Internet Brotherhood. And we had also this free space that we could all gather there and do these therapy sessions. And... Um, This is the clock. Okay, and I will show you a very, very... Ah, we have to stop, eh? No, no, you don't have to stop. I'm just saying... I to think the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have to start. It's going to be... When do we have to finish? Like, the meditation will be like 15 minutes. So I will show you this last project now. It, this is the one of the... Um, the latest... Uh, I want also to make a connection with different mediums that I work with. And I work a lot of also with neon. And neon, I started doing neon works around 2005 when I read uh, Neuromancer. It's a very, very important book by William Gibson. And William Gibson, in a way, in this book, he was describing uh, the neon the light of the neon is the color of the networks. It's basically the color of the internet. So I was very much intrigued about this uh, quote and this idea that we read in this cyberpunk novel. And I thought, okay, I will start making things with neons because also the, the light, like uh, the internet, it has some like physical substance, it's not really clear what it is, but there is also some physicality, there is that. I was very, so I was commissioned by the Onassis Foundation in Athens to work on this very complicated neighborhood that has an anti-cancer hospital. It's this like stadium that also 
Some people also died years ago through hooliganism. And there is also next door to us that you cannot really see it. There is the headquarters of the police. Like on the left side, we were actually were forbidden to take any photos of the police headquarters. So it's also like a highway that when you pass from there, you don't really feel something extremely positive. So my idea was to get this wall there with this foundation. We work very hard in, in bureaucracy to get like um, there is was this council of this building where it's. And then I made this series of talismans that they speak about the different contemporary feelings. They are also related. It's my interpretation of also some contemporary logos with in, in, uh, in combination with some ancient but also multicultural uh, symbols. For example, this one is the command symbol in our uh, Apple keyboard, but also in this in African and uh, Celtic um, tradition, it's also the symbol of friendship. Uh, also, the fr in California, now it's very, very recent logo and talisman. The mushroom is becoming the talisman against anti-depression. And it's also the, the logo of recycling the mushroom. So I placed them, this thing, and this is like a... It's been lit 24 or 7, and um, yes, that's it for that, for my work. Now, enough with the blah blah. I want you now to close your eyes and find a very comfortable spot. Close your eyes, please. Let's take a few moments to settle in now. I want you to open your eyes now and please put your phone on flight mode and close any apps that can distract your meditation. But keep your phones, keep your phones, we will need them. First of all, now put your phones on your lap and close your eyes again and we will scroll and scan our bodies. We will do a, a fast body scan. Try to relax and now let's make three very big breaths. Now think there is a neon light scanning your forehead. Scanning from your forehead. Now it's going to your eyes. Think of your eyes. Are they tired? Now go on your nose. your lips, you can move your lips like kiss, like something, do a movement so you can relax them. 
now go on your throat Now this neon light is going on your chest, your shoulders, your lungs. Move to your abdominals. Try to breathe some air in your abdominals. Now go on your genitals. Feel your genitals. Go now on your knees, your calves. And the soles of your, of your feet fill the earth now. Please notice any tension on your body. Okay, now open your eyes and hold your phone. Please hold your device with one hand and close your eyes again. Feel the phone in your hands. Think how heavy it is, feel the weight, move it a bit. Think of the hand holding the phone and the other is holding nothing. I want you to visualize now rays of information in the form of text or images are coming out from this device, this volume. And also vice versa. Information that this device is receiving from you. Imagine this as a sponge. Open the eyes again and think for a few seconds what sensation this thing we done now brought you. Stress, smoothness, love, maybe nothing, maybe the presence of this device, maybe it's totally nothing for you or so there is something. Think about this presence that you hold in your hands now. Okay, now I want you to Switch on your phone on normal mode, the way you use it, on the normal mode. 
and open your eyes. And what I want you to do is to open your favorite social media app, maybe Instagram, Facebook, and I want you to go in this part of the application that you can see the whole list of your followers or the people you follow. You can choose one. I, it's very important to have a list of people so you can see. And there, what I want you to do is to select your favorite person from this list. I'll give you a few seconds to do it. Think spontaneously about a very good friend, a person you like, a person that is very well known and it's good for the universe. <laughs> Stay focused on this person for a few seconds. And try to send good waves to this person. Think something nice. Waves. Think of a nice experience that you want to have with this person. Visualize an ideal scenery with this person. Send a good wish to this person. Maybe you can say out loud, may this person be fine. Maybe this person be fine. Okay. I want you to now go the same list of your social media app. You have it in front of you? And I want you to choose now your least favorite person. <laughs> Spontaneous, be spontaneous. But if you don't know how to choose, you can choose some celebrity, I don't know, somebody that you don't really admire. Think why you follow this person. I want you to send good waves to this person. And I want you to have images of this person that is doing something good to you or in the world or in your communication. Think something that this person could change for your everyday opinion you have. Send a good wish to this person. Maybe we can say out loud, maybe this, maybe, may this person be well. Let's do it. Let's do it. Maybe, may this person be well. Go ahead. So now I want you to go now again 
on your phone and look on your profile page. Not the followers or uh, following people. Just look on your profile. I want you to see, to realize if you have a feeling of censorship, admiration, shame, narcissism, love, let's do that for 20 seconds. Maybe you close your eyes now. I want you to pray or send some nice waves to you, to yourself. Open your eyes and think how does it feel to pray for your own well-being? Have you done it recently? Think of it. And now let's close our eyes for the last time. We are almost there. Let's think of this situation we have here. Let's think about us in this physical place right now. Let's send, let's send good feelings to everybody physical in this place that we interact with our particles our atoms <coughs> open your eyes and thank you. Thank you, Gabriel Sacco and Daria Pugacheva, which are my students in the school. Thank you very much, uh, Angelo. Thank you very much, everyone, for being part of this. Uh, and I'm not sure if after this meditation you are uh, in the mood for questions or you just need to go out with this uh, feeling of, um, um, you know, of relaxation or thoughts that you've been through. Uh, one thing that I want to add before our, we receive questions is that um, uh, we are, I mean, we said this before, but as there are always new people coming, we are right now in the discourse discourse bar that was made that is created by Flaka Haliti, which we have the luck to have her with her with us uh, today, and uh, together with Meta Heaven and Marcus Marcus Misen, and this is part of her exhibition, her solo show that you can see in the the other part, but this is also part of the show. So thank you very much, Flaka, for having us here for Seven Crossings, and also for the ones that they, 
came now. We, this program is a kind of a continuum through the three, uh, let's say, periods of Summer Academy. We are already in the crossing number seven. We are relying on somehow kind of a tarot pack and on a book by Italo Calvino, which is called The, um, the Castle of Cross Destinies where people find themselves in a forest and they cannot communicate with, with each other because they have been muted. And so they communicate only with a device of, of non-logical means. So we've been discussing about tormented realities and uh, somehow magical, magical remedies as today throughout these uh, crossings. But questions, is there any uh, like person question or people prefer to... Some question, nothing? Any questions? If not, I have only one question, and then we can release you free. Of course. And uh, this is, um, of course, knowing the work and, and uh, also hearing you um, talking about uh, this shamanism and the religion and the praying, and then the social media. I have to say that, and I'm playing the devil's advocate, but this always comes in my mind, this institution of the church, the institution of uh, the internet, the mega people behind the social, um, let's say, um, uh, so social uh, applications like Facebook or Instagram and all these, like so mega companies, mono companies, mono multi multicultural companies, monotheism, praying, and institutions as such. And then we have you that you propose to us a kind of a let's say sacred ways of approaching ourselves and the reality around us. How do you bypass this conglomerate of uh, mega mono uh, culture and hegemony? Actually, I believe that, okay, let's start with the internet. The internet now is something that even technologists cannot really describe anymore because it contains multitudes. So there is the totalitarian internet, there is the spiritual internet, there is the uh, crazy internet, the corporate internet, neoliberal internet. So there are many, plenty, plenty of situations inside this structure that is basically uh, many things inside there. Well, the internet as the real world is actually copying a lot of things from the physical world and it's something that actually we can't really control it anymore. And in the future, we will see other instances of the internet. And uh, through, they speak about telepathic um, connections and the technology will be some sort of mediator. So I believe that there is gonna be an internet always that will be mystical, experimental, democratic, and always in the side of the people and not the corporations. Amen. <laughs> and about the church? Like the, the church technology, let's say, the kind of re religion technology. The religion technology uh, is... Or institution. I mean, how you bypass this? Uh, well, I mean, there are, as an artist, I always take advantage of these platforms. I see them as platforms, the church, technology, Silicon Valley, all this kind of stuff. In a way, we artists use them, all these things. In the, for example, in my work and in my quilts, I use a lot of gold and quilted materials for my fabrics, which is kind of similar to the way quilted vestments of the Greek Orthodox Church were made. So in a way, artists, in a way, are here to kind of twist like exist, existing scenarios and presenting things that we actually, everyday, uh, everyday life is twisting this everyday life and mundane and structures that they teach you to behave like this. We twist that. Right, thank you very much. Any question? No? Okay, there is a ah. question, so somebody can help me to get the microphone. Um, so, um, I have a question, but um, 
not really sure, but... Um, we can't hear you. Hello. Uh, so speaking of materials, I feel like the quills can play a significant um, material. But here we also see the neon light. Yes. So, um, I, I'm just curious how you decide for a, the way that you chose the material that conducts the work, like be inside and outside the veneers. Um, yeah, because nowadays I saw so many like uh, kind of like lighting uh, work that people also use neon. So how to to make this kind of like uh, unique, or uh, that people look at the work and can see that um, something like significance from an artist. Like for example, if I remember about your work, I will remember of the. Um, uh, quilt uh, the costume of your performance, but how about like for another words like the neon light here? Um, I don't understand so I don't, much. I think, I think you are asking how. Uh, Sorry. The, like how he combines the material, right? Yeah. Understand yeah. Right. How, ah. material I chose these materials. <laughs> ah, can you? Is my microphone is switched though? Ah, okay, okay. okay. I try to. I, as I told before, they are the materials that I choose, they are not accidental. They have a relation with my first, uh, with my first kind of um, interface, which is the internet, and this is where I started. I started as an internet artist, and now I do all these physical works. As I said, the neon represents the, the, it's the color and the material of the networks, according to William Gibson, which for me is one of the big heroes of this survey I do through technology, shamanism, and some techno-mysticism. Uh, in regards to the pieces, uh, the fabrics, I, I'm very much interested in my way, my work also negates also technology. I also organize this gatherings of people that we actually can have the option to do digital detox but also being with technology and in a way also these uh, materials fabrics that i use i even that they are blocking technology i find them very technological so i play this kind of toggling between off and online offline and online all this kind of stuff so it's fabric and neon. That's it for now. <laughs> All right. So uh, there is one more question. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I find this. Um, like trans shamanic approach really interesting and I was wondering um, uh, what for you are the connecting links between um, maybe the, 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 like the, the Greek proto-shamanic culture and the, the I don't know, like I, I guess like you're, you're trying to touch on this universal kind of uh, shamanic knowledge, right? And I was, I was wondering what is, what is this linking point for you and uh, how do you avoid um, questions of uh, cultural appropriation, for example, which is really like, it, like you're really like playing in the fine lines of that, which I find really, really interesting. Maybe you could share something about that. It's, uh, you want to say no, something? No. Ah. Um, I am very much interested. When I started working for the project in Korea, I had already like made a research. I'm not interested only the conceptual uh, connections because there is a connection from ancient Greece to Asia. It went through Caucasus, went all the way to Siberia, and there are, there are connections. But what was also made this connection also with Korea was the semiotics we use. They use there in shamanism that we use in, uh, in ancient Greece. At the same time, before emojis, and all these things, there was a, a language of pre-emoji language that was actually appropriating like codes 
from indigenous languages. Uh, Silicon Valley appropriated all these things. Basically, this command symbol that you see there, it's an appropriation from an African Sudanese symbol that speaks about friendship. And they made it a command symbol. So everything, this is very much what my research is all about, all these like things that I find online and I connect the dots also from my trips. What we were also doing in Mexico, we were actually decoding this surrealist park with this internet artist, a very physical place. We were decoding the symbolism and all these things that this surrealist residency was happening there. So for me, um, cultural appropriation, it's open source. I mean, when you are an artist and you make like a contribution to something that it's already part of the cultural commons is a new thing. It's not cultural appropriation. It's something that I find it interesting. And of course, everybody's using Plato. It's not cultural appropriation. It's part of the public domain. It's part of the cultural commons of the world. I think to that note, thank you very much. Please um, be with us before you upload Angelo, be with us next Thursday, where there will be um, three museum cu um, directors and curators speaking to us how um, institutions respond to cases of emergencies. It, we will have with us a Katerina Deco, which is now the director of this festival in Kratz that I cannot pronounce, but maybe somebody else can, Steiner Herbst or something like that. Uh, we will have Zdenka Badinovac, which is now the director, she will be online actually, Zdenka could not come, but uh, uh, she's the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Zagreb, and Sebastian Czochki, which is the chief curator of uh, Warsaw Museum of Contemporary Art. So we are waiting for you here in the discourse bar once more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.